Good afternoon, folks. Uh, it's Dave Burrows. Uh, on behalf of the entire Barometer Investment Team, I want to welcome you to our uh, weekly uh, Barometer Readings update. This is another in a series that we've been doing since the beginning of the uh, Corona uh, uh, virus outbreak. And, you know, it's obviously been a very difficult time from a news perspective for investors, uh, both professional and private investors alike, uh, to try and manage risk and reward and, and, and work our way through what has been, you know, a very difficult uh, series of weeks. Um, so just to, to kick off, uh, I've been starting each of these calls just with a quick review from a market perspective. Uh, as, as you know, we believe we are and have been in a secular bull market in stocks. And there was a very abrupt uh, sell-off that began the end of February and, of course, sold off uh, into the end of March. Uh, it was about 34% top to bottom. Uh, it was the fastest sell-off of that magnitude in market history. And it has been uh, a difficult ride if you're busy reading the newspaper and certainly from a healthcare perspective and, and a geopolitical uh, perspective as well. Um, we had an initial bounce off the market bottom uh, probably technically driven. We got completely oversold. We got uh, a good dose of fiscal and monetary stimulus that drove the next bounce. Uh, then we went through a period of time where market chopped its way sideways. And then we started to see the reopening uh, and some of the data around that. And I think that uh, to say that the market has been strong relative to the news and relative to the economic backdrop would be an understatement. It has been remarkable. Uh, when this began, I think that one of the first things that we said was we thought the least likely outcome would be a V-shaped bottom for the market. Certainly, it doesn't look like it's going to be a V-shaped bottom for the economy. Uh, whether or not we have some uh, choppiness and testing in front of us, we'll have to see. Uh, but let's go through and, and take a look at what our work is showing. Um, as you know, uh, we are driven by data. And we uh, do a lot of work to try and understand not so much what we think should happen, but what is happening. And we know in a healthy market over time, more and more security should participate in a rally. If breadth in a universe of securities, in this case, the NYSE is expanding, it means there is money being brought to bear. Uh, there are buyers and you have the wind at your back. And so to go back over time, this just takes us back to the late 1990s. There have been a series of times where we're measuring the percent of stocks in long-term uptrends. When the percent of stocks in uptrends got to below 30%, for instance, 1998's Asian currency crisis. When breadth again started to expand, first of all, the strongest stocks rallied first, and then as time went by, more and more stocks joined the rally. You got a significant bottom in market breadth in 2002-3 in the tech rec, rallying very strongly coming out in March of 2003. We got, a, we got two lows during the financial crisis, one in October, where the market rallied from October to January and then retested the lows in March of 2009. And that, again, was a successful retest. Fewer stocks broke down. That gave another significant buy signal. There was a significant buy signal from breadth in the NYSE in 2011, the end of the European debt crisis. There was one in 2016 at the end of the China slowdown and the commodities rollover of 15, 16. We got a significant low in January of 2019 following the sell-off December of 18. And then of course we got the low at the end of March where only 6% of all stocks had been able to maintain an upward bias through that sell-off. Now you can imagine, those that did were really doing something right and have had a great rally since then. But since then, we got a great bounce off the bottom and then we had some testing. And the market breadth has pulled, pulled back and about three weeks ago reversed higher again and continues to expand. So as we sit today in the NYSE, 66% of stocks are in long-term uptrends. That's positive, it has been expanding. The higher it gets, the more pervasive the rally, the easier it is to make money. But we have to watch that. Now we watch four short term indicators uh, for signs of change in breadth as well. We look at the percent of stocks trading above their 50 day moving average, percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum, percent of stocks trading above their 150 day moving average, and percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows. And we publish that regularly. So uh, significant 
a significant rally for the S&P. We're now trading 8% below the old high. Uh, so there's been a very strong recovery. Um, when we showed our indicators a week ago, we showed that our long-term indicators for both the NYSE and for Canada were positive, that our short-term indicators were positive, that global breadth was yet to expand. And we have seen that improve. We saw global breadth turn higher this past week. And what, if you've been watching the German DAX, the CACARA in France have had very good weeks uh, today, excellent days again. J Japanese market's been rallying and the Chinese market's been rallying. And of course, breadth is a concept that works across all types of securities. And when more and more geographic regions are showing expansion, that shows the resiliency and strength of, of, of the market. Now, the rally in global stocks has not been as strong as what's happened in the S&P or certainly the NASDAQ. If we look at the global Dow, it's recouped about half of what it gave up initially. And, but you can see that it started to accelerate higher over the last five, six trading days. We started to see a little bit better relative strength versus the S&P. And that might have to do with the sectoral makeup. Uh, of the global indices as opposed to the US, which is so dominated by tech and by healthcare. If we look at different universes of securities, you take the tech group, really only down about 3% off the highs. Okay, Russell 1000 growth off about 4%, S&P off about 10%, EFI off 13 and a half. These, this data is from our friends at Credit Suisse, Jonathan Golub, and you can see emerging markets have been lagging. Certainly value has been lagging behind that and the Russell 2000 small caps a little bit worse. When we look at the peak to trough uh, pullback, you know, clearly the small caps had it much worse. Now, the leadership has been pretty clear since the bottom. We've had relative outperformance in technology and a number of structural themes. And of course, at Barometer, we're focused on trying to identify structural themes that can lead to multiple expansion over time. So things that are good getting better. So technology was obviously doing very well coming in. Relative price performance versus the S&P had been rising. We went through a very difficult sell-off and relative strength has been rising off the bottom. That includes groups like semiconductors that are benefiting from the move to 5G. And we've talked about semiconductor stocks over the last few calls and names like Intel and NVIDIA. In the last couple of weeks, we've had great passes in microchip technology, which makes uh, analog devices that go into uh, many, many different devices, including into automobiles, because we know the content of semiconductors going up in products. Marvell Technologies also has had a very good week. So that leadership has continued. Cloud leadership has continued. Certainly the work from home theme has continued to drive people to use applications based in the cloud. And cybersecurity, of course, has also been really important. Internet retail and commerce has been very, very strong, trading well above the old highs, making relative and absolute new highs. Healthcare has been a leadership theme, although you can see the relative leadership has been lagging a little over the last couple of weeks. And gold was very strong, making good, strong highs, and has pulled back into support here, it's given up a little bit of relative performance in the last couple of weeks. So, so what is it that's changing? When we talk about wanting to see a healthy environment, we like to see breadth expand, see new great groups be brought into the rally, and see the buying start to move uh, to some different groups. So certainly, in the last couple of weeks, we've had a couple of, of big things happen. The first thing is that over the last seven trading days, the US dollar, which is seen as a safe haven and certainly spiked against the basket of world currencies coming into this crisis, started to back off. And we've had, from my perspective, a trend change in the US dollar that points to more risk acceptance, people taking dollars and putting them into risk assets. That has to do with uh, overseas markets. Certainly, if you look at the ETF PIE, which is an emerging markets ETF of strong momentum companies, you've seen a big pickup in relative price performance. Uh, that's, a, that's a positive. Uh, within China, and China has shown some improvement, it's a good indicator to look at because they started opening before uh, the North America did. The Chinese consumer has been quite strong off the bottom, but in the last week, Chinese consumer stocks have really started to take off. Uh, pointing to a more successful reopen. The second thing that's big that's changed 
is the bond market. And we've talked a lot about how we believe we're going through a generational low in bond yields or a high in bond prices, and that this is an extremely crowded trade. Now, clearly when the sell-off came, you had a big spike in bond prices. Perhaps that may have been the low in yields. Uh, and since the market started to rally, bond prices started to back off into the last week, that kind of accelerated. From my standpoint, using point and figure charts, the long end of the bond market uh, looks as though it has topped and is rolling over. I think that that has big implications. Uh, certainly, we know that when we look at the allocations that have been going into the bond market, they've been enormous. Now, I understand because since 1981, if you stacked up stocks versus bonds, they've had roughly the same return. Because as bond yields fell, you got your coupon and you got capital growth. And over the last year, I think a lot of investors came to the bond market looking for capital growth for falling yields and that it's a very crowded trade. Also over the last uh, 18 months, very little went into equities. So if we look at positioning, positioning in bonds, when we look at asset managers, very, very significant, right? It's about as high as it's been in 30 years. And when we look at positioning in equities overall, positioning in equities relatively low. Now we know in the early 1950s when yields started to rise, from the last generational low, stocks outperformed bonds five to one for the next 35 years. Investors started to look for dividend growth as opposed to just the, the, the fixed yield on a, on a bond. So that's something that we are watching for, but this is important because the positioning is relatively low in equities and relatively high in bonds. Bonds start to underperform, that can force some money to start to rotate and we know the bond positions are very significant. It also has implications for financials. Now we know that the financials lagged badly off the bottom. This is an ETF of large cap US banks. They had a halting rally over the first two or three weeks. Then they retested the lows. And they've moved a little higher. And in the last week, they've had a big move. Today, bank index up over 6%. That's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's the least owned sector in the market. Second, it's the most economically sensitive. And third, it's the one is most helped if yields start to go higher. They start to make a spread on their lending. Now, there's a dichotomy here because the market's been rallying now for several weeks. It is possible that there is short covering taking place in those sectors that would hurt the worst if this COVID crisis went on longer than expected or the reopening was bumpy. So it is still possible that this is some significant short covering, but it's hard to ignore. The banks have had a great move over the last week and that is broadening. National Bank in Canada leading uh, off the lows, came in with good earnings, uh, good revenue growth, uh, good, good returns out of their capital markets business. Royal Bank also came out well through their, through their earnings in the Canadian universe. On the other side, Bank of America, JP Morgan, uh, large cap US banks also have had a really good lift. And if in fact, we are seeing a generational low in yields, banks could outperform for several years, assuming that the damage coming out of this COVID healthcare crisis is not so significant that it causes significant rate downs. At this point, it doesn't look to be the case. Industrials also had a great week over the last week. After languishing and again doing some testing, they blasted off led by Boeing, which had been a laggard in the market. It's had a good bounce. Again, could be short covering. We have been in automation, which we think is the most important structural theme in, uh, in the industrials. But in the past week, transports really started to lift uh, and sort of led by the railways. So uh, we're long CP rail. Uh, we think that they are probably the best managed of the railroads. They're gonna have an extremely low operating expense uh, in this quarter. And we're starting to see a nice turn. We're also in Kansas City Southern, we're in, uh, in uh, CNR. So more indication that investors are willing to take economic risk. Home builders had a big week this week. We saw the mortgage applications earlier this week come in well ahead of what was expected. And the companies around home building, the, the suppliers 
uh, looking quite well. Home Depot's gone back to make new highs. This is one of our poster children for dividend growth that we really like in Sherwin-Williams on the home improvement side. I suppose people have had time to be at home uh, making upgrades. So what really has changed over the last week is we've had a significant lift in the most economically sensitive sectors. High beta has had a good move. Now, it so far has not come at the expense of growth stocks. They're both continuing to do well. As of, as of yesterday, several of the relative strength new highs came from the large cap growth sectors, but we are seeing some certainly some buying, whether it's short covering or real buying in economically sensitive groups. So look, we still think there is a tremendous amount of risk and we are not whistling by the graveyard thinking that everything is fine. We do expect we're gonna see pullbacks. Uh, June is notorious for pullbacks. At this point, our short and long-term data is positive. Things may be a little extended, but, but I just wanted to ask the question and talk a little bit about why it is that we think that we are still in a secular bull market and why it is that pullbacks could be relatively shallow going forward. So first of all, let's talk about positioning. Institutional investors continue to be very cautious. The good news is private investors in general have been quite aggressive in getting positioned. The discount brokers are reporting record new account opening. And I think that there is a memory back to 2008, nine, where that was a generational opportunity to make some good investments. But in the institutional community, portfolio managers continue to be very careful. This is a chart that charts the uh, quantity of S&P ETF unit spiders that are on loan, meaning they've been shorted as a hedge against portfolios. So very significant short position outstanding in spiders. When we look at um, the S&P held by uh, asset managers, S&P futures, again, where they were very high coming into January, despite a significant rally, uh, in fact, the S&P futures positioning is quite benign, meaning that there is buying power that could be put to work. There's about $4 trillion in money market funds, which and money has continued to pour into money market. And you can see after the initial rally, uh, uh, many of the asset managers have been pulling back on their exposure. When we look at hedging and speculating, there is a very significant short position in S&P 500 futures. In fact, as short as they were, they've been in this entire uh, COVID crisis. So positioning continues to be really cautious. This could be a source of buying. And my guess is that over the last week, there are a number of people being squeezed in to cover their shorts. So we continue to be cautious about the outlook for a correction, but with all of that short positioning, pullback should be fairly shallow because uh, portfolio managers will be looking for opportunities to cover those shorts. Let's look at sectoral positioning. We know that uh, over the last three months, there have been lots of buyers in healthcare, there's been lots of buyers in technology, off the lows, there's been lots of buyers in energy, but there's been sellers in financials, sellers in industrials, and sellers in consumer discretionary. These groups have had a good rally over the last week. Clearly, it's squeezing in some of the short sellers. When we look geographically around the world, on this distribution chart, we plot each of the major geographic regions based on what percent of their equities are in long-term uptrends. If it's colored green, it means breadth is expanding. If it's colored pink, it means breadth is contracting. So you can see for the majority of the developed world, we're seeing expanding breadth. And the average company has 50.2% of stocks and uptrends, which means that can go on for a long time. We don't get overdone until 70 or 80% of companies are in uptrends. So a couple of points I wanna make, first of all, our local market, the Canadian market, the TSX is underperforming. It's still 14% off the highs. Uh, it has been lagging on a relative basis versus the US. If materials could get going or energy can get going, maybe they can pick up some of that slack. Uh, but at this point, still the Canadian market is lagging. Let's talk about data. 
from an earnings perspective, when we look out over the next few quarters, both in blue for the Russell 2000 and gray for the S&P 500, it's gonna to continue to be bleak. Estimates have continued to come down in general. So analysts are very cautious and have very little visibility as to what the earnings picture may wind up looking like. If we look at it for this upcoming quarter, what it looks like sector by sector, obviously the cyclicals or those that are most economically sensitive are likely to have the biggest reduction in earnings. Financials are also in that camp. What we might take away from the market over the last 10 days is there are investors betting that the reopening is gonna go better than expected. And that remains to be seen. But these are the groups that are the, have the highest risk. It's why we have been more cautious about having a significant exposure because they are the sectors that would most be most hurt if the reopening was bumpy or elongated. The non-cyclicals like healthcare and technology will have the best uh, visibility and they've had the best rallies off the bottom. From a valuation perspective, the market's expensive. When we look at the forward PE for the S&P, you know, it's sitting at 21.6 times earnings. Uh, and that's, that's not cheap. Um, certainly it's expensive versus history, but that being said, we've had a tremendous amount of liquidity pushed into the market. The Fed, the central banks, and, and governments with both fiscal and monetary stimulus has pushed a mountain of money into the system to keep liquidity, and a lot of it's finding its way into the stock market. Certainly, uh, we are at an unusually high PE, but PEs can get high and stay high if investors are prepared to look beyond the chasm to what may be on the other side and where the economy might be as we come out. From an economic data perspective, there's no question there has been really, really difficult data that's come out. Uh, when we look at the employment data, we've given up basically 10 years of employment gains in a very short period of time. Industrial production has been very negatively impacted. Retail sales have been very negatively impacted. But again, remember, the market isn't looking at the data as of today. It's looking as to where it might be eight to nine months from now. So the recovery is what's gonna be important. So what are we seeing? We are seeing some improvement. I mentioned that we've seen some significant improvement in the mortgage data. And this is auto sales, which obviously fell off a cliff. We've started to see them recover. We look at a number of different high frequency data points to try and assess what other investors believe. And one of the things that we look at are credit spreads. How much excess return is a bond investor demanding to buy either an investment grade bond or a high yield bond? And it clearly, the spreads clearly spiked during the drawdown and credit spreads have been improving since. We watch very closely to make sure that the market continues to believe that credit is continuing to function. Now, again, this is helped by liquidity that the Fed is providing by the very fact that the Fed said that they would consider buying corporate bonds and high yield bonds, even though they've done virtually nothing, investors see a backstop. And so they see a willingness to buy that extra yield that you get in a corporate bond. We'll watch to make sure that that continues. From a high frequency data perspective, if you look at Apple's mobility trends, and we're looking here at uh, driving data in dark blue, transit data walking and the baseline, we can see that clearly uh, mobility is way down, but is starting to recover. We are not seeing much recovery in transit. This is the TSA's uh, total traveler throughput. You know, travel, air travel is continuing to be a real sticking point. Open tables, measurement of reservations being made in the economy, slowly improving. And non-commercial bank asset loans and leases, obviously, fell off a cliff and have started to show some improvement. It is important though to realize that the S&P 500 is not representation of US Main Street. These are global businesses in many cases not focused on consumption uh, and much less economically sensitive perhaps than some of the Russell 2000. Um, when let's talk about the stimulus for a moment. There's been an enormous amount of stimulus pushed into the system this is a chart that plots the velocity of money or the degree to which it's finding its way into the real economy. And at this point, we are yet to see an uptick 
that that liquidity is actually finding its way into businesses, although it is finding it in the market. So there are dichotomies. We have weak data economically. We're seeing some improvement. There's tons of liquidity that is supportive of asset prices. We're not seeing the liquidity find its way into the economy. That's a concern. That's something that we have to watch. We are going to continue to be data dependent. We do think we continue to be in a structural bull market in stocks. Since 2013's exit from a structural bear market, the market has been working its way higher in higher highs and higher lows. We tested that recently right back into the uptrend. And of course, the same thing has been going on in the NASDAQ, which has been leading. So to this point, we think that the long-term picture for equities is really favorable. We could absolutely correct in the short run. And we recognize that and in the pools and the funds that we manage, some are more aggressively positioned. Some of them are a little bit more cautious just to make sure that we've got something that's defensive if we get a near-term early summer pullback. Our equity strategies are well ahead of the market and positive for the year. And that comes to the fact that we've been in some very constructive structural themes that have continued to lead the market. But we watch every day for signs in the short run that we could pull back. We wanna make sure that we stay flexible. We don't wanna to want, want to wind up over our skis. One thing that is for sure, there will be future corrections that will give us opportunity to make further investments. And if things get worse, we'll definitely get defensive. Uh, we have no problem with that. We've done that in the past many, many times. But as it stands right now, with the bond market weakening and the US dollar weakening, those are signs that from a longer term perspective, there is appetite for risk. The fact that some of the economically sensitive sectors are turning higher, that's positive, that's expanding breadth. Uh, and as long as our data remains positive, we'll remain invested. Um, thanks very much for tuning in. Hopefully it's useful today. Um, next week, we will have a, a, a new specific topic. We'll do an update on markets uh, and put a spotlight on a couple of leadership themes. Um, if you want to follow us in between, certainly don't hesitate to follow me on Twitter. Uh, I do put up some data from time to time and uh, thoughts on things that are changing. So on behalf of the entire Barometer Investment Team, I want to thank you for taking some time with us uh, on this Wednesday afternoon. And everybody, please stay safe. Thanks so much.